Hello, everybody. I'm Robin Green. I'm the Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pretoria, and I'm also, for my sins, I suppose, the Chair of the School of Medicine at the University of Pretoria. And I have a strong interest in community pediatrics, and that's why we're going to talk about fever today. Euro Pediatrics was a great Congress. We learned a lot about general pediatrics, and that's really the theme of that Congress, is to bring together general pediatricians to talk about daily management of, of children. And many of the topics were very exciting. I the usual things about diabetes and, and child abuse, but the, the kind of things that I was interested in were, were fascinating. Uh, for example, I went to a lecture on epigenetics, and, and this is a phenomenal new science for us in pediatrics. Epigenetics, which really means on top of the genes, is a whole new branch of science that says to us that many inherited conditions do not necessarily need to express themselves in children if we get the epigenetic modification right. So a classic example is allergy. We always used to believe that if a mom and a dad were both allergic, say had allergic rhinitis or asthma or atopic dermatitis, it was a 85% chance that a baby would be born with the same condition. We know today that that's no longer true because of epigenetics. So there are phenomena in the environment that we can use in science today to do things to pregnant moms and newborn children to put on top of the genes epigenetic modification of that risk of allergy. And isn't that phenomenal that we no longer have to simply accept that genetic conditions have a particular phenotype outcome that they automatically express. And in addition, what I wanted to tell you about epigenetics is that it's like compound interest because epigenetic modification is also inherited. So if we can turn it off in this generation without having to do further things in next generations, we can actually make sure that the epigenetic modification of risk of allergy, as an example, but for many other diseases, is reduced as the generational effect takes account. And so I think that's one of the important things that I learned. There were lots of other things that we, we spoke about, how to modify allergy, how to, mo how to look for asthma in children who have chronic uh, respiratory symptoms. Uh, uh, it was fascinating and I really enjoyed the conference. I am the author of the South African Fever Guideline, really intended for primary healthcare workers and pharmacists, but I think it has a, a major role to play across the, the disciplines of medicine. And what is really important about having a local guideline, and again, I learned this at the Europe Pediatrics Congress, where we met a large number of pediatricians from around Europe and, and, and the world who had their own guidelines, is that there are differences in countries around managing fever. There are different disease entities that cause fever. Remember, in Africa, we have things like malaria, which produce fever, and we need a really clear guidelines around managing malaria and being suspicious of malaria because it still kills a large number of children if we don't get it right. So there are a lot of different disease profiles that require specific guidelines for a country. There are different medications and medication names that are available. And there are different philosophies of managing the disease in different parts of the world. So I think the South African guideline is really critical. We need to update it soon because we, it's getting a little old now, but we need South African material uh, so that we inform the population of doctors and patients in our own country against the standards by which we look after patients in our country. The South African guideline is important in the sense that it makes a large number of statements about managing fever, starting with the definition of fever. So we say that a fever is only a fever in a child if the auxiliary temperature is more than 38 degrees. A large number of my doctors say a child has a low-grade fever if the temperature is 37.8 or 37.5. That's not fever by definition. So a peripheral temperature above 38 is a fever. Very important starting point because it's from there that we need to start to investigate and, and, and ensure that we do two things in the management of fever that we don't overreact to the vast majority of fevers in children, which are just due to minor viral infections. But by the same token, we don't miss serious causes of malaria. Many of the bacterial infections, 
meningitis or septicemia or even malaria. We don't want to miss those. And so the guideline is very clear about warning signs, red flags for when you should take a fever seriously. Otherwise, we need to manage fever um, in the sense of making sure that children are more comfortable and we're managing more from the point of view of discomfort rather than being obsessive about bringing fever down. Fever, remember, is part of the human body's response to an, to an insult, like an infection. And so fever is important that the body heals itself by means of a fever. And we don't want to necessarily stop that process. But if a child is uncomfortable from the fever or in pain, then of course, fever medicines are important. And we'll talk about those just now. So that's uh, really important. What We have other very important key messages in the guideline, for example, around vaccination. A large number of nursing sisters and pharmacists and patients believe that if a child has a fever after a vaccine, we need to manage the fever. We need to give something, a medicine, to stop the fever. That's completely untrue. In fact, it's harmful to, to reduce the fever after a vaccine because the fever suggests that the vaccine is taking, the vaccine is working. And so it's really important not to manage fever around vaccines. There are many other things that we talk about in, in the guideline, and we'll talk about those sec in a second when we speak about which medications we really uh, suggest are useful in the South African context. Our guideline has done an extensive review of the literature around fever medication. And quite interestingly, at Europediatrics now, we had a, an opportunity to look at the pharmacies in Ireland around fever medication that is stopped for children. And in all the European countries, believe it or not, there are only two fever medications that are on the market for fever in children. One is paracetamol and the other is ibuprofen. We, they do not, Europeans do not have combination fever medicines with all sorts of other hidden and toxic ingredients for children. And I think that's phenomenal and fantastic. And that's what we should be looking at instituting in South Africa, because there are only two fever medicines with a good body of evidence that they control fever, that they're effective in managing fever and that they're safe for children for fever. And they are paracetamol and ibuprofen. And we should really be recommending those two drugs for children, not combination medicines, certainly not combination medicines with codeine containing products or with antihistamines or decongestants. They are toxic for young children. But even then, when we speak about paracetamol and ibuprofen, I always hear from parents, those drugs don't work for my child. And the reason they don't work is that we're not using the doses correctly. Now, remember, there are two important things about these medications. The dose of ibuprofen is 10 milligrams per kilogram per dose, and it can be given six hourly. And the dose of paracetamol is 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose, and it can be given four hourly. And when we use those doses, you do get fever control. The other important issue about fever management is that parents believe that a household teaspoon is five mils. And a household teaspoon is usually about three, three and a half mils. And that's why underdosing happens. So part of the last strategy we're going to talk about in a, in a minute about patient education is to give patients this sort of correct advice. Medicines must be administered with a, a medicine teaspoon or a syringe and not with a household teaspoon. So let's try and get paracetamol and ibuprofen as the drugs of choice for fever in children in South Africa. The most important thing about fever management is that we as doctors, as pharmacists, can do all we like to educate patients and ensure that patients know how to manage fever. But when you as a parent wake up in the middle of the night and your son or daughter is standing at your bedside with a raging fever, you as a parent lose all insight and all hope. And it's a devastating phenomenon. And so it's really important that we educate parents and give them 
material that they can be taking home so that when this sort of disaster creeps up on you in the middle of the night, you are not left wondering what to do. So I think patient education, parent education through detailed leave behind leaflets is critical for this condition. And those, and those sorts of patient education messages should be clear. The dose that I've said to you, using a medicine teaspoon or a syringe and not a, um, a household teaspoon, not leaving medication at the baby's uh, or child's bedside because children who are feverish are also dehydrated and what they do is they reach for the, the bottle that's standing on the bedside table in the middle of the night and take a big swig and that's when we get toxic reactions. Making sure that parents know that we no longer recommend tepid sponging, that we no longer, know, we know today that uh, pyrexial convulsions are not related uh, to the degree of fever and it's not, you don't need to be obsessive about getting fever down in order to prevent a fever fit. Fever fits are genetically determined and they don't occur in response to the degree of fever. They occur independently from the illness. Parents need to know these bits of advice. And what I really think is important is that it's not that we just say it to parents. I think it's important that we give them material to be reading at home. And, and of course, for the modern generation, um, uh, um, facilities on the web, facilities on social media, all of those things are important. But patient education, patient empowerment around about fever management is the critical step that we need to get right in South Africa.